I feel bad for Nico. He has to play with Brookie. You know what's even worse? He already got the superior experience of playing with me, and now he has to go and play with Brook. It's like living in Fresno and having to move to Clovis. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always uh, at, where, where is it? At Red Rock underscore Beeble. Of course, I'm a little bit frazzled having been up forever for this NBA trade deadline. Today's show, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Starting off, I'm going to be looking at the fantasy breakdown of those trades. We did it live as the trade deadline was happening. Myself and David Locke and hosts right across the network, and you can check that video and podcast out. But now the day is settled. All the pro- uh, projections have been updated over at Basketball Monster, so I'll get a bit more clarity on, on my takes on these scenarios with some other situations that have arisen during the day and then we'll do our standard look back on Thursday's games and preview for Friday's games Michael Bolton let's get to it to it let's get to it indeed let's start by looking at some of these trades that did go down Nikola Mirotic was traded from the New Orleans Pelicans to the Milwaukee Bucks. I think this does hurt Miritich a little bit. He goes from being maybe a 28 to 30 minute a night guy to perhaps a 25 to 27 minute a night guy. The Bucks blow everybody out. They'll probably blow people out even more now, and that's going to limit him, not to mention that we're going to have a, a lot of minutes for Antetokounmpo ahead of him, and Brook Lopez is there also. So I think this does hurt Miritich. He's not quite at that drop territory yet, but it is definitely a worry if we move forward and they play him 22 minutes a night, then it's a, a concern. Uh, DJ Wilson and and Ursan Ilyasova get a little bit of a hit in this deal. They acquired him for four second round picks and uh, Stanley Johnson and Jason Smith. Stanley Johnson heading to New Orleans. I don't think it really does anything for his value there, but the Pelicans did make some other interesting moves. They waived Markeith Morris after acquiring him yesterday, and I think that does help, uh, obviously, Kenrick Williams there, who I was a little bit concerned about. Now, Randall's value is fine, and the news came out today, like I've been saying for the last week or so, is that Anthony Davis will continue to play out this season, and everyone can continue to be skeptical as much as they want, and I understand that. And yes, he will miss some games. That is a 100% guarantee. Will he play 38 minutes a night? Probably not, but he's not going to go out there. I've seen people suggest, oh, why don't they just go out there, play him one minute, and then that'll satisfy the fact that he played, and then sit. There's no way that's flying. He'll go out there, he'll play, he'll put up his solid numbers, and this is what I did anticipate. I wasn't 100% convinced on it, no way, but I was yeah, pretty feeling pretty good about him going out there and playing out the rest of the season. Of course, this hurts Jolly Local for quite a bit. Now, we do remove Miritich from that front court rotation, so... We are still going to get uh, Okafor playing, but he's not going to be playing the 30 minutes a night. In fact, last game before Davis was even back, he only played 24 minutes. You're going to see a lot more Darius Miller, a lot more Kenrick Williams. Now, Williams is an interesting 12-team league out. I think he's already better than Etuan Moore and definitely a better better fantasy contributor. So he is worth having a look at uh, on that Pelicans team. And of course, that value for Randall and Davis is uh, is pretty strong, which is always good news. Marc Gasol, the other move, uh, he moved from Memphis to Toronto. Huge move there. Jonas Valanciunas, DeLon Wright, CJ Miles, and a second round pick coming back to Memphis. Memphis also made a, uh, a couple of other deals. They sent out Shelvin Mack and brought in Tyler Dorsey from Atlanta. They also sent out Garrett Temple and Jermichael Green and brought in Avery Bradley, and they waived Omri Caspi in this process. So this is where the value really is uh, concentrated with this team for, for, uh, for the fantasy value. Uh, in Memphis because of just how much opportunity has opened up. And a lot of people now, oh, is Mike Conley a shutdown candidate? And just don't mention that term shutdown to me. I just absolutely despise that term because it gets overblown is so, so much and it pisses me off. Anyway, Jonas Valanciunas, he is a clear pickup to me. He should be the starting center on this team. Triple J, Jaron Jackson Jr. Without Jermichael Green here to steal minutes from him, his minutes will go up. And yes, Green being gone doesn't mean that he stays out of foul trouble, but it means that that Bickerstaff is actually going to have to play him through some of these foul issues. He's a clear out because somehow, in some bullshit taco leagues, Jackson is available in 18% of them. Add him. Ivan Rab, I think he gets some significant mid-20s uh, value in terms of minutes playing the backup center. I don't see why they would play Joakim Noah ahead of Rab, considering how good Rab has been as well. He'll play some backup power forward minutes also. 
a lot happening there for Rab with Gasol and Green gone. Uh, this does help Ivan Rab, and I don't think that Valanciunas is coming in and playing the same minutes load that Marc Gasol was prior. So value there. Delon Wright, probably the prized possession of this Gasol trade, even though he is the same age as uh, Jonas Valanciunas, which might amaze some of you. He's not starting at point guard, but he can play the one, the two, and the three. Shelvin Mack is gone, so Bickerstaff's obsession with him is out. Justin Holiday is still around, but I think that Wright is going to be able to get high 20s in minutes across three positions. Uh, he should be playing over Avery Bradley because he, at this point, is considerably a better player than Bradley, and Bradley shouldn't be a part of this team's future. They should be looking to move on from Avery. So Wright, more like, he's a, is he a 12-team ad? He's close to it. Same with Rab, they're close to it. I don't have full confidence that they must add guys unlike Valanchunas, who is, and Kyle Anderson, who's available in 50% of leagues. You go and add him everywhere if he is around. But Rab and Wright get some value. I think Justin Holiday's value is bumped there as well. CJ Miles and Bruno Caboclo in deeper leagues also get a little bit of a bump there in Memphis, but not enough not enough to do huge amounts uh, to their, their numbers. We're talking just deeper league stuff. Now, in Toronto, there's quite a few... Um, Quite a few questions coming out uh, about about this Raptors situation of, of what they're going to do with Serge Ibaka and Marcus Sol. Now, you make the argument that Mark is a better player than Serge, and I don't think too many people would have arguments with that. Ibaka struggled significantly last season as a power forward, so I think they'd be reticent to go back to that too much. I think this hurts both of these guys pretty significantly. I don't think Gasol remains a top 50 guy. I think it pushes Ibaka not into the drop zone, but getting perilously close until we see how this rotation plays out over the next couple of games. Um, but it is a big hit to both of these players. With DeLon Wright gone, with CJ Miles gone, Norman Powell and Fred Van Vliet get a bump. Van Vliet was awesome in Thursday's game, but that was without the fun guy Kawhi Leonard, so that boosts his numbers. But he can be a back-end 12-team league guy as well, given 26 or 27 minutes instead of 21 minutes. That's interesting there for Van Vliet in Toronto. And I think it hurts Siakam a little bit just having Gasol in town as well. Another big man to play some extra minutes there. Uh, of course, they did move on from Greg Munro, sent him to Brooklyn uh, in a trade. And of course, Greg has now been waived. As Greg runs in, we realize this could get dangerous. Yeah. So that's how that Toronto side of things work out. Let's move over now to the Clippers who were part of that Avery Bradley Garrett Temple deal. They're also involved in another deal today, the Tobias Harris deal a couple of days ago as well. But they traded with the Lakers. They sent out Mike Muscala. They brought back Michael Beasley. They kicked his ass out of there. And they brought in Ivica Zubats to be their starting center. Marcin Gortat and Milos Teodosic have both been waived now also. So while it does, you know, looks great for Zubats starting center, remember Gortat was playing what 16 or 18 minutes a night and you can say yes Josh Boban's gone as well. But how many games did both Boban and Gortat play together? Very, very few. So you're losing one. You're losing one of those guys. You're losing your know, Marchan Bobanovic. Is that even the right word? No, Marjanovic. I'm completely mixing up my words there. That's who you're losing. You're losing the Knights that Gortat played and the Knights that Boban played, and they didn't really overlap. So that's where Zubats moves in. Now, I think with the removal of Tobias Harris, you'll see a little bit more of the Rooster, Danilo Gallinari, and, uh, the, and Prison Mike gone as well. Yeah, but, uh, there's some more minutes opening at Power Forward. So we might see some more Zubats and Harrell combinations there in that front court. John Motley for, for deeper leagues could also find himself in a, in a larger role as time goes on as well. So Zubats is more of that 14 to 16 team league ad rather than a, a must add 12 team league goal, how everything's settled down. As for Jermichael Green, he's going to get some of those power forward minutes as well. So that's another situation there that maybe prevents them from doing much of the Harold Zubats front court combination. Harold, uh, not Harold Green is not a must roster guy to me. Again, if you're looking to roster him, he'd want to be playing 30 minutes a night. And that would mean the Clippers would want to commit to playing Gallinari at small forward, which could be disastrous. Now, this small forward position is open. A lot of the beat writers have suggested that Garrett Temple will be the starting small forward. There is also Baby Neck Wilson Chandler who could start there. We had Sindarius Thorne. Well, start today, but he is not even guaranteed to be a regular part of the rotation. There's Landry Shamet, there's a Jerome Robinson as well, two rookie guards who've played some minutes at small forward too. So there's a bit of a mess at that position for this team. What it does do is it opens up minutes for Shea Gilgis Alexander. I feel like this was a bit of the front office, much like the Denver front office did to Michael Malone last season, where they traded away Jameer Nelson just so that he wouldn't play him. I think this is what they were doing with Doc and Avery Bradley. So he is gone. This should push Shea into 30 minutes a night now. It makes him and Patrick Beverly 12 team league adds. Yes, Lou Williams is still around, but there are enough minutes to go around with those guys. And in no circumstance should they be prioritizing 33 year old Garrett Temple 
over Gilgis Alexander, and I, I really don't think that'll happen. As for Baby Neck Wilson Chandler, a 32 year old small forward whose best position is power forward when Daniela Gallinari plays there, he's not going to be an ad really outside of the deepest of deep type formats. Philadelphia made a couple of deals. They acquired James Ennis. They traded also away Markel Fultz to Orlando and brought back John Simmons and a first and a second round pick in that deal. A pretty decent return. We thought they wouldn't be able to get a first round pick out of anybody for Fultz, which is weird considering he was the number one overall draft pick just uh, two years ago. But they get rid of uh, Fultz there. There's so much depth on that on those wings now and the forward positions that Ennis is not going to have the same role that he had in Houston. He comes in there maybe 20 minutes a night. Simmons not guaranteed, ben, not Ben Simmons, uh, um, John Simmons not guaranteed to play every night. Not a good player. Can't shoot threes. Another one of the Sixers guys who can't shoot threes. He's not going to be too much of an impact guy and not going to be any sort of real uh, fantasy ad at all for this uh, coming season. As for Fultz, there's some conflicting reports about what his value is, uh, what his value is like. Uh, for this season, just you know, with the, will the Magic play him at all? Will they look to see what they've got, or will they sit him down and try and really do, you know, get him ready for next season? I don't think he's going to be 12 team valuable, but I do love his dynasty upside here. A situation where he can come in and not have the pressure of having to try and lead a team to a playoff berth to you know, title aspirations, where the team that needs a point guard almost as much as anybody in the NBA, the Orlando Magic, they're going to give him that opportunity. There's DJ Augustin and Isaiah Briscoe there. So he is going to get that opportunity. It probably comes next season, and we could realistically see a top 100 season from Fultz next year. It's going to depend on a lot of stuff, whether he can get his mind and his shoulder right and his thoracic outlet syndrome and all that sort of stuff. But there's a huge possibility, and he probably couldn't have landed in a better position in terms of pressure and opportunity. All that de definitely works in Markel Fultz's favor in this deal. The Celtics also traded away Jabari Bird to the Hawks. He hasn't played all season. He will be waived by Atlanta as he deals with his uh, his legal issues. And as I mentioned, Greg Munro went from the Raptors to the Nets. He would be waived as well. The Kings and the Blazers made a switch of young players who won't play or don't play. Caleb Swanigan and Scal LeBissier, nothing to really see with those guys. On the other side of the Muscala Zubat deal, Mike moves over to the Lakers, of course, but what this does is it opens up value for JaVale McGee. I think he becomes a must-roster guy again. Tyson Chandler still in the mix. And then you have uh, Muscala filling in almost the Beasley role. He'll play probably a little bit more than Beasley, who's not an every, who wasn't an every-night guy. He'll play some backup center and some backup four. He's a, a shooter in theory who has struggled at times. He is not going to be sniffing 12 or 14 or even 16 team league value here, Mike Muscala. A bit of a weird trade from the Lakers to trade away their starting center for a guy like Muscala who really uh, isn't as good as what Zubats is. But uh, shockingly, they needed shooting around uh, LeBron James, something which who could have foreseen that when they signed Rondo and Stevenson and Beasley in the offseason. Um, I know you can't respond to this, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else I've missed here. Nick Stauskas and Wade Baldwin went were rerouted from the Rockets to the Pacers. They're going to be waived, and that opens up that opportunity in Indiana for Wes Matthews, who has been bought out by the Knicks. He will sign in Indiana. If you didn't like Wes Matthews as the starting shooting guard on the Dallas Mavericks, if he wasn't a 12-team league for guy for you then, he's not a 12-team league guy for you now. It's a worse situation. He's got to compete with Corey Joseph and Tyreek Evans, though Evans has been shit house, and he is a clear drop in 12-team leagues, Tyreek. But a guy like Matthews becomes that deeper league stream. It takes 12-team value away from Joseph. Upside of Evans is gone, and it probably takes Edmund Sumner out of the rotation, and probably Aaron Holiday on most nights as well. He won't be there in that rotation on the on the majority of nights. So we've talked uh, Miritich, we've talked Gasol, we've talked James Ennis going to Philadelphia and Fultz going to Orlando, Zubats and Muscala deal, the Avery Bradley Garrett Temple scenario between the Clippers and the uh, and the, and the Grizzlies. So a lot of stuff happening. So had a lot of people asking me the question, Josh, can you rank your best pickups? And you know that I despise ranking stuff because it's never as simple as that. It's what do you need? What position are you looking at? What stats are you doing? Is this guy adding to your team going to hurt your team? Is it going to help your team? Is this guy that's the third best guy on my list actually better fit for your team than number one? So you can check all that out over on Basketball Monster and see how everything projects. But these are a bunch of guys who I think gained value and now move into, if not must roster 12 team league status, but definite 12-team uh, league ad players. Jonas Valanciunas and Triple J, Jerem Jackson Jr., probably the two guys here with top 50 upside uh, of, of these players, and Kyle Anderson. So three Memphis guys who I think are must-roster guys. 
Dennis Smith after the Porzingis trade. He should be rostered in all leagues at this point. That was a couple of days ago, of course. Uh, the Undertaker, Dwayne Dedman, he wasn't moved on from. He, along with DeAndre Jordan, won't be bought out. So he's going to remain in that role. So he's a bit of a winner here. Uh, as for DeAndre Jordan, won't be bought out for the Knicks as well. I still think Mitchell Robinson has value. We saw them limit uh, DeAndre's minutes a little bit last game. And he could very easily, DeAndre Jordan, move into being a drop guy. So he's not necessarily a, a winner here, but... Um, I think The Undertaker is by not being moved. JaVal McGee is a winner. He gets some of his minutes back in this scenario, and I think he can be a top 100 guy as we move forward. The two Dallas big men, Dwight Powell and Maxi Kleber, not only did they lose uh, DeAndre Jordan, but the pencil Harrison Barnes is gone, so a lot of opportunity opening up for both of those guys. Ivan Rabb uh, and DeLon Wright and Justin Holiday, all of those guys in Memphis can be 12-team league guys. They're not must-roster guys, but they do have some value there. Shea Gilgis-Alexander, I think, is an add in 12-team formats as well. Jeff Green in Washington, I think, is an is a, an add for 12s, more 14s, but an add for 12. Justin Holiday, I mentioned. Jordan Clarkson in Cleveland, who God knows who their starting shooting guard is going to be. Maybe Brandon Knight for deeper leagues could be a guy there, but Clarko is an interesting 12-team league add. Fred Van Vliet in Toronto gets uh, a sniff at top 150 value. Tyler Johnson the same. And Iman Shumpert. Guys, a lot of the times in trade deadlines, guys get moved. And what it does is it kills guys' values rather than helps them. But there's a lot of guys whose value has been opened up here. It hurts Serge. It hurts Miritich. It hurts Toby Harris. It hurts Marcus Sol. I think all of those guys lose value uh, after this deadline. Um, uh, but there's a, a ton of value opening up and most of it concentrated in Memphis. So that's you know, my cov coverage. A quick little recap of the trades that went down today. Some fantasy value. Go and have a look at it all over on Basketball Monster. You can see how these projections shake out. There's still a lot of uncertainty, especially in Memphis and with the Clippers, the two teams I'm most uncertain about because they traded about half their roster and working out who's going to move in, who's going to start at shooting guard in Memphis, who's going to be the small forward uh, for the Clippers. What are they going to do with that front court in Memphis? There's still a lot of question marks with these guys, but there's some significant upside for a lot of these players right across the NBA. All right, guys, let's move on now to the regular portion of the show. I feel like I've missed stuff with the trade deadline, so I apologize. If there's something specific that I should have talked about, please uh, please let me know. Tweet at me or leave a comment on this YouTube video, and I'll try my best to get back to those. Uh, whatever it is, it'll probably come up in the next couple of days or so, but uh, I do apologize if I have missed something. Let's go on to these awards. Monstrous line of the night. The monstrous line of the night from Thursday is Miles Turner of the Indiana Pacers. Turner was doing everything defensively in a uh, in a pretty significant win over an undermanned Clippers team, putting up really big numbers. 17 points with three triples for Miles. Only the two boards, but three assists, four steals, and six blocks, and seven of eight shooting for Turner. A fantastic performance. Those defensive stats in getting combined 10 steals and blocks is like absolute gold. Turner is the 25th ranked player over, actually, let's go even further, over the last three months, he's the 21st ranked player, mainly because his blocks have been out of control, 2.9 blocks, and that's his best fantasy category by a such a significant margin. For example, the Z score for his blocks, 4.08. His next highest category is field goal percentage at 0.57. So we're talking about a bit under eight times more val as valuable as anything else. And if that drops off, then we're talking almost like a Victor Oladipo situation from last season where ranking can really plummet. But it's kept up pretty much all season. I still think that there is a concern that there will be some uh, some dry spells and blocks, but he has been really impressive this season. And he is your monstrous line of the night for a trade deadline Thursday. Waiver wire line of the night. The waiver wire line of the night is Terry Rogier. Of the Boston Celtics, Kyrie Irving was back, but Rogier was still strong. 19 minutes, 19 points. Five triples, four rebounds, six assists, and a steal. He had high usage. He had high efficiency. Hit all four of his free throws. He was five of nine from the field. He's been pretty good of late. A top 150 player over the last two months in only 23 minutes per night. There's been some extra roles there with some blowouts and with some starts with Kyrie. Uh, Kyrie sitting. Kyrie's missed seven games or so over the last month. I think it's yeah, seven games over the last month. So that's elevated some of Rogier's numbers in that time. It's a bit under half of the, those, those overall uh, overall games um, that he's played. Actually, for, to be fair, in the last month, he's had five out of 16 games as start. So I'm, I'm sure changing him a little bit. I still wouldn't be looking at Rogier 
as a 12 team league guy he didn't get traded at the deadline as we uh, as we expected sorry he didn't get traded as anticipated not uh, not that we expected him to get traded he's more of that 14 team league guy and a really key stream player the deep league of the night is his teammate it's daniel tice 23 minutes, 20 points, 6 rebounds, 2 triples, 2 blocks, and 2 assists on 9 of 11 shooting for Tice. He's got that backup center role locked down at the moment while Aaron Baines is out dealing with that foot issue. Uh, he's never going to be like this every game, Tice. He, no one is this efficient. This is a, a nice performance, but we leave him for the, the deeper leagues, the 20-team leagues. And even then, it's just a short-term scenario for his, uh, for his overall value this season. Young Gun of the Night. It's another Boston Celtics player. The Young Gun of the Night is Jason Tatum, who played 36 minutes, had 22 and 10 with five assists and a steal, shot 64% from the field. And it's important to see him doing this with Kyrie Irving there as well. That's back to back 20 point games from Tatum. I believe it's back to back Young Guns of the Night for him as well. Top 50 over the last month. I think a top 60, top 55 type finish for him for this season is realistic to expect. And there's no real big spikes in his production, big drop-offs in his production. His month-by-month -month numbers look really, really similar. And he's not shooting at exactly the same level as last year, 43% from three down to 38 this season. But he's still been really good and really strong as that mid-round player. And um, But as I said the other day, I think for him to elevate himself to a top 20 guy, he's either got to you know, really up those steal and assist numbers or that usage got to go sky high, which could happen depending on what happens with either this team or if he moves as part of an Anthony Davis trade in the offseason. The dud of the night is Lou Williams of the LA Clippers. Lou struggled. This game was it was a big blowout, so all of the minutes for the Clippers guys were reduced. Williams only 17 minutes, 10 points, 2 rebounds, 2 assists. I wouldn't be too worried about his long-term value. He obviously wasn't moved at the trade deadline. Uh, just not a good performance here from Williams. He will be better than this significantly. There is a risk, I guess, at some point that someone like Landry Shamet or Jerome Robinson, that they start to bring Lou back down to maybe 24, 25 a night as they're not pushing super hard for the playoffs instead of the 30 minutes a night he'd been getting for the last couple of weeks. That is a real possibility with Lou, but it's not a drop scenario. Maybe if your trade deadline hasn't passed in your fantasy league, you could look to, to move on if someone wants to buy, uh, buy his recent production prior to this game. But this is really the, the low end of what uh, Lou Williams is likely to do. The plus minus goats, Dante Cunningham had the best net rating, a plus 173.1. He is not a regular rotation guy, so not much to see there. Well, then the worst net rating, Tone Tolliver, negative 128. Very, very little for us to care about there. A couple of injuries to come out of today's game. Jared Bayless uh, with a toe injury that the Wolves were already dealing with the absence of Jeff Teague, Derek Rose, and Tyus Jones. And then their fourth string point guard hurt his toe and wasn't able to return. They do play again on Friday. So we'll have to check his status there. Of course, when any of those guys come back, Jared Bayless's value is in the toilet. On the positive side, Kevin Love has been upgraded to questionable. Of course, he's a must-add player wherever he is available, if he's still available. I would not activate him from injured reserve at this point. This is something I stress all the time. I will get questions about people. Yeah, who do I drop when Love returns up two weeks before he returns? I would wait one, two, three games. A, there's a chance of re-injury. Pretty big chance. With any injury, generally lower body, it happens quite often. And even these first couple of games, what he plays, 12, 13 minutes? Same as Karis Levert, who's going to be back for Brooklyn in Friday's action. Like, I wouldn't be activating them off IR. They're not going to come in and be top 100 players in their first game back. If it's LeBron, sure, you do it. If it's one of those, yeah, Steph Curry, if it's Carl Anthony Towns, if it's Anthony Davis, you activate those guys. Guys who are outside that top 10 range, I would leave them there, especially after long layoffs like both Levert and Kevin Love. Just leave them in your IR spot and just let them sit there for a couple of days, a couple of games. You might not have to drop someone because in those couple of days, someone else might get hurt and he's giving me all switcheroo. And then that other person moves into injured reserve and then that guy goes into your active list and you're done. You haven't had to sacrifice anybody. So that's the way I look at it. 
And news of Derek White looks like he'll be returning after the All-Star break. That's only a couple more games, so that's some pretty good news there for him with that plantar fascia injury. He is a pretty strong hold to me. I believe he's a pretty consistent top 100 guy for the rest of the season. If you could deal with him not being around for the next week, I would absolutely be holding him, and I'd look to add him. He could be uh, not necessarily a winner of the trade deadline, but there's a real possibility that he is a guy where everyone's jumping to grab someone else. They drop Derek White, or he just sort of slips through the cracks and you can go grab him. I think, yeah, in top 70 is realistic for him to finish this season. And there's a chance, he, again, he only misses another two or three games. So he is a, definitely a guy that I'd be looking to, to see if anyone drops him or if he is on the wire after this injury. Let's go into these games now and uh, and break them down, see what, uh, see what we can work out of these games from Thursday. The six games on, the first one we look at, the Clippers and the Pacers. The Pacers win 116-92. The table, Montrez, Harold, 90 uh, 19 points in 29 minutes, but this Clippers rotation, it, it's a mess. The big positive here is 20 minutes for Danilo Gallinari, 12 points, four triples and two blocks. I think a massive end to the season is coming for Gallinari as he has to absorb a ton of usage. But of course, they've got to welcome in Shamit, Temple, Jermichael Green, and Ivica Zubats into the next game. So minutes are going to be all over the place. We've got 28 minutes from Jerome Robinson, 29 minutes for Sendarius Thornwell, 29 minutes for John Motley, 24 minutes for Ty Wallace, 14 minutes for Angel Delgado, which is not going to happen. I'm sure many of you listening have no idea who Angel Delgado is. So this rotation, the ma the fact that they got smacked, not really anything interesting. As I mentioned earlier, Shea uh, is a guy to add. He had 8-1-6 and six here. Patrick Beverly's got some value. And then you've got Zubats for those fringe deep leagues. And a lot of people seem to be disagreeing with me uh, on Zubats. I talked about it earlier. I think he's going to come in and be this must roster guy. But I just don't see... Are they just taking away all these Harold minutes to play him twenty five a night? I think that's I think that's a real um, it's a real stretch to think that's going to happen. I could be very wrong with that though, but that's how I see it. For the Pacers, Boyan Bogdanovich was great, twenty nine and seven with three steals. He's a must roster guy. Well, Thad Young, five steals, man. He has been excellent over the last six weeks or so. I wasn't really confident in him keeping that up, but he's proven me wrong there. Corey Joseph, thirty two minutes, thirteen nine and six. Joseph normally doesn't do this, and he's gonna cop a hit in minutes when Wes Matthews arrives. Would be my guess. So I still think he's probably more of a fourteen team league guy. Well, Daz Collison had fourteen three and five, and Sabonis really struggling at the moment. Demontis eight and seven in his twenty two minutes. He's not a drop. But it could be the case once we get to uh, playoffs. Tyreek Evans, yeah, he's a clear drop. Eight points in 16 minutes, and then Matthews has to come in to take some of that playing time away as well. Not a good Tyreek performance. The next game up, we look at the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Orlando Magic. The uh, the Magic win 122-112. Really disappointing stuff from Minnesota. Townsie was great, 27-11 and five big percentages, but overall just piss poor. Wiggins stuffed the stat sheet apart from the percentages. 23 and nine, three assists, three steals and two blocks. And then Westbrook, your percentages, 36 and 60 from the field and from the line. He's playing a little bit better of late. Wiggins, Akogi had 13 and four. While Dario Saric, second straight big game, but the 21 minutes is the worry here. Still more that 14 team league ad. With Bayless dealing with a toe injury, we had 13 points in 21 minutes from Isaiah Kanan. He had six assists. Maybe he plays 45 minutes in Friday's game, and that could make him a one-day stream, but he is not a long-term player because he's not an NBA-caliber guard really at all, while we also had 15 minutes for Luol Deng. On to the magic. My man, John Isaac, he is a must-roster player. Nine and six in 29 minutes, two steals and three blocks. Fantastic. And Terry Ross, I think he's a 12-team league guy as well. 32 points, six triples and five rebounds. It really does come down to if you need threes and points for Ross, but that was great. Uh, Vucevic, 21 and 10 with two blocks, and Azza Gordon had 19, 6 and 5. Uh, Augustin, 6, 1 and 6. He's going to lose value at some point if Markel Fultz actually plays, but we still don't know whether Fultz will be ready to go at all this season, unfortunately. Um, next up, the Raptors, they blew out the Atlanta Hawks, 119-101. With the Raptors, a lot of things have got to change. Kawhi's got to come back into this mix. Marc Gasol's got to come back into this, or got to enter this mix. Siakam was great, 33-14-4 and four with two steals and a block, but Kawhi and Gasol put a big pin in that. Van Vliet had 35-6 and six in 37 minutes. He's never going to play that amount on most nights. Lowry had 13-8-13. and 13. Well, I guess he can keep that up. And Norm Powell had 11 points in his 21 minutes, and Abaka is at the beginning of the end. 12 points in 26 minutes. He's not a drop yet, but uh, let's see how that first game goes. It could be really ugly for uh, for Surge. 
For the Atlanta Hawks, Torian Prince, 37 minutes, 19, 1 and 3 with 5 triples. I still think he's a 12-team league guy. I've continued to say it. This line would show that that uh, is, is the truth. Now, this doesn't mean this is what he does all the time. And, of course, he's had some shit games, but I'm all for having him. Trey Young, 19, 5 and 5. And the Baptist, John Collins, had 12 and 12. Kent Bazemore, 6 points in 15 minutes. This is going to be the norm in terms of playing time. Maybe there's a buyout. I really, really doubt it. He's got another year left after this one on a pretty big salary. So Bazemore is sticking around and his minutes are going to be reduced. So there's no reason to have him in 12 or probably even 14 team leagues. Well, Fanta Pants, Kevin Herter, just a disappointing 5 points in 28 minutes, but it's 28 minutes. And he still had 3 rebounds and he still had 5 assists. So I do like him. While The Undertaker, 10 and 4 in uh, 24 minutes, Dwayne Dedman, he is a 12-team lead guy, while Amari Spellman got the majority of the backup minutes there. Spellman's a guy that I said to watch, depending on what happens with Dedman. I'm still watching him, but it's not as much 12-team stashy as what it was beforehand. The Memphis Grizzlies and the Oklahoma City Thunder. The Grizzlies got smacked 116.95, but this roster is going to be really different. Uh, welcoming in Avery Bradley, CJ Miles, Eunice Valanciunas, Jonas Valanciunas, sorry, it's Eunice Yerepko, uh, Kyle Anderson, Dillon Wright. Like, these are five significant rotation pieces that have to come in. Triple J, 27 and 7 with two steals. Jaron Jackson had four fouls. Amazing uh, that he was able to play that much. Uh, really, really strong. Of course, he's a must roster. Well, Ivan Rabb, I talked about him earlier. 15 and 9 with two blocks. He's a guy that I'd be grabbing also. Bruno has shot Bruno Caboclo. Terrible shooting. Today, great. 6 of 9 for 16 points with three threes and five rebounds. And interestingly, no defensive numbers. In all the other games, he's been getting defensive stats. When Kyle Anderson returns and Avery Bradley and CJ Miles, it's probably going to push Bruno out of a rotation role. Mike Conley was back. He struggled 15 points on 15 shots with seven assists. I'm not really that worried about Conley and being shut down as many people seem to panic about. Well, Justin Holiday, he, he is just trash. Six points in 32 minutes, 11 shots, three assists and a block. But I still think he's got a chance to get some minutes. And yeah, I'm prioritizing behind Delon, behind uh, Rab, behind uh, Valanciunas on this team. But he could be a 12-team league guy, but he's by no means a must-add guy or someone that you should be banking on to be a consistent producer. You look at the uh, Thunder and you see Stephen Adams played 19 minutes, and that's disappointing. They went quite small early on. He only played, I think, five first half minutes. 11 and 6 with two steals and a block. This is not an ongoing thing for Adams, so don't worry too much. But his absence enabled Nerlens Noel to put up 4 and 6 with three steals in 20 minutes. Jeremy Grant was great, 20 points. Westbrook had a triple-double with trash percentages, while Paul George had 27 points and four steals. So strong from the usual suspects in Oklahoma City. The next game, the LA Lakers, they beat the Celtics in Boston on a Rajon Rondo game winner, 129-128. LeBron James. LeBron James. 28, 12, and 12 with three steals and five triples. Huge from him, while Rondo, 17, 7, and 10 with three threes. Of course, no trades of any significance were really made with this team. So Rondo is a guy that we just hold on to until Lonzo comes back, and then it gets a bit cloudy. The future MVP, Kyle Kuzma, he scored, and he did it efficiently. 25 points with five triples, very little else, but strong enough. He, he's obviously someone to watch. And then it's going to be interesting what they do when Reggie Bullock arrives, because KCP played 23 minutes, Lance played 17, and Josh the Hitman Hart, eight minutes. Someone's going to lose out big time when Bullock comes in, whether it's Lance or whether it's Hart or whether it's both of them. Real worries there. Uh, if you, not, none of them are twelve-team league guys. Pretty clearly, Ingram eleven two and seven two steals and a block. Just terrible with the percentages. Uh, obliterated you in those categories. Four of fourteen and two of six. Really, really poor. While well, McGee played thirty minutes as the starter, seventeen and eight with a block for Javale. I think he's a strong add in most leagues. For the Celtics, I've already spoken about Rogier Tatum and Tice, but Kyrie had 24, 7, and 8, and Gordon Haywood struggled again, 4, 6, and 5. I would be very, very happy leaving him on the waiver wire. While good old Marcus Morris, the Marcus Morris from the history books, the one who is not good, had three points in 24 minutes on 1 of 5 shooting. I am worried that he is not going to have value in fantasy playoffs come around. Up to you whether you hold him or not, but I, it is definitely trending in the, in the opposite direction of where you want it to be going uh, for Marcus Morris at the moment. The last game I want to cover here is the San Antonio, not that I want to cover because it's the only other game left, the San Antonio Spurs and the Portland Trail Blazers. 127, the Blazers win. 118, San Antonio. They brought everyone back and went back to their usual starting five. Bryn Forbes was starting. He had 11 points in 23 minutes and is not a 12-team league guy. 
Rudy Gay had 25 on 15 shots, and DeMar DeRozan, 35, 6 and 6. Really strong from him. Bertans started, didn't hit a three, and played 24 minutes. He's probably just a streamer for those three-pointers, much like Pat Mills and Marco Bellinelli, although no one really could get hot and, and knock these threes down. Well, they really... Sorry, let's... Be, let's rephrase that. They hit 57% of their threes. They only attempted 21, which is a real disappointment for this team. Uh, Aldridge struggled as well, 17 and 10. For the Blazers, it was Rocket Rodney Hood's debut. He played 25 minutes, and it basically cut Seth Curry, uh, Mo Harkless, and uh, Zach Collins' minutes. Collins was barely in the rotation in the first half, so all of those guys lost minutes for Hood. Now, Hood had 14 points. He shot very well, and he did nothing else. So if you, unless you expect him to be an 86% shooter and give you 14 points a night, he's not a 12-team league guy. He's a points-type streamer. McCollum had 30 and 9 with 7 triples, 2 steals, and 2 blocks. He is on an absolute massive tear at the moment. I think this is a huge sell-high moment for Siege. While Damian Lillard had 20, 24, 24 points, 9 assists, and 5 steals. Man, they are numbers that you just don't get from Lillard, those assists and steal numbers. Lehman played 31 minutes, which is probably on the high side. 13 points, 3 rebounds, while uh, the chief, Al Farouk Aminu... Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. 11 and 8 in 22 minutes. If you want to drop him for Rab or Valanchunas or any of those hot pickups I talked about earlier, he is not a must-hold 12-team league guy. All right, let's flip it over now and look at some DFS action before we wrap this up. And my uh, hours and hours of podcasting for today is over. On DraftKings, the perfect lineup was McCullum, Wiggins, LeBron, Tatum, Siakam, Van Vliet, Bogdanovic, and Corey Joseph for a total of 415.75. And that was $49,700 worth. And on Fangel, Van Vliet, Westbrook, Wiggins, McCullum, Bogdanovic, LeBron, Siakam, Tice, and Noel for a total of 425.3, and that costs the full $60,000 dues. All right, guys, let's flick to DFS now. We're going to be looking at Friday's uh, Friday's action, eight games across the NBA. Uh, focusing on FanDuel pricing for today, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty with these games. We're not sure if some traded guys are going to play or not, and a bunch of injuries we've got to pay attention to as well. The first game is uh, looking like a real blowout. The Wizards hosting the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Wizards are 10.5 point favorites here. A total of 220. Uh, big opportunity for Punch Bob Ship Bloke. Uh, here, Bobby Portis moving across to Washington. Of course, Otto Porter is gone, so that's going to mean we get uh, Jeff Green uh, back into a pretty large large role. My name is Jeff. And then we just don't know how they're going to utilize uh, Jabari Parker in this situation as well. So quite a few things. The big news for Cleveland is Kevin Love has been upgraded to questionable. Now, I've got God knows what sort of an idea who's going to start at shooting guard for this Cavs team. Chetty Osman is out as well as Tristan Thompson, but Love has been upgraded to questionable now. He's probably not going to play a huge load of minutes, and it's going to have an impact on Ante Zizic, uh, oh, sorry, Zizic and, um, and Larry Nance, but it is obviously great to have here Love ready to return. Now, Sexton was massive last game, 41 points in 42 minutes. That was a little bit fluky, that level of usage. But with Alec Burks gone uh, and Chetty Osman out, there's going to be a lot of shots for Sexo. So I like him as an interesting GPP upside guy here. Saturansky's at 6,800, playing really well at the moment. It's all coming down to what Brooks wants to do. But I still feel okay about Tom, but I'm not looking at him as, as a must roster player. Jordan Clarkson, I think he's in for a pretty sizable role here. Could start at shooting guard, although they seem to be really reticent to put him into a starting job uh, because of his uh, ability to contribute in that bench uh, bench role there. He's at 5,800. Not a bad bet to get to that level. Brad Beal's at 9,400. I think Beal has a relatively safe floor in a really strong matchup. Well, Nwaba is another option for the Cavs to start at shooting guard. I'm not really all that interested there. Jordy McRae, Chase and Randall. McRae's got that big upside, but yeah, I don't really believe in that. Jabari Parker's at 4,200. He's an interesting tournament guy. That's really all I'd be looking at uh, with him. But, of course, with uh, with Dwight Howard still out, Mark F. Morris not around, uh, the minutes at starting position going to Jeff Green. Parker's going to have an, an opportunity here to get some minutes, but still just for tournaments. While Ariza at 6,200, a lot of minutes will probably be coming Trevor's way here. I'm just not sure that he is the best play, but the matchup does suit him. Jerome Blossom game, Australia's own Deng Adal, some value for both of those guys potentially, but they're not big producers, so they're guys I'd probably leave alone. At Power Forward, Love is at $5,000 on FanDuel, and that's really cheap. We know that any sort of 
anything close to Kevin Love's usual minutes, he would smash that and smash it hard. But oh, I just don't know how much he's going to play. It is worth throwing into a tournament, JIC, but it's hard to be too uh, too interested in him. Jeff Green at 5,900. I feel Green is almost a lock for 30 points, which makes him strong cash value. Not sure his upside is there. Well, Punch Bobby himself, Bobby Portis at 6,500. We don't know if he is actually going to play or Jabari Parker. We would assume they, they would two days after the trade. 6,500 for Punch Bob. He's going to have an opportunity now. It's going to come down to him or Thomas Bryant. Or do they start Portis at power forward? Do they believe Portis is a power forward? If they do believe that, they're wrong. But there is an opportunity here for Portis. And of course, this puts a bit of a dent into what Tom Bryant can do. He had 55 points in 32 minutes last game. But prior to that, Scotty Brooks was playing him like 18 or 19 minutes. So there's a lot of uncertainty with both Portis and Bryant for this matchup, just with the uncertainty of how Scott Brooks is going to run things. Over on DraftKings, I like Sexton at 45. Portis at 53 is a lot more appealing on DraftKings. Geordie Clarkson and Jeff Green also come in looking pretty strong. And the 8,800 for Bradley Beal, I think, is a pretty nice price tag. Next up, the Knicks and the Pistons. The Pistons, eight and a half point favorites. The total is 206. Of course, the Pistons lost Stanley Johnson and Reggie Bullock getting in Thon McCare. And that opens up that, and Sfima McKay look, and that opens up a big opportunity here for the Duck, Luke Kennard. We don't know exactly how Dwayne Casey's going to run that because Casey has been really frustrating with his use of his wing players. He's got Langston Galloway. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Who has been uh, sometimes good. Sometimes shit. So that does uh, confuse things somewhat there. The Knicks, uh, Ennis Cantor and Wes Matthews are gone. Not that Cantor was playing, but that opens up a lot at that shooting guard position. Do they go back to Damian Dotson? Do they go to Alonzo better than Doncic Trier? Or does Fizdale completely dick us around and go with, say, Mario Hazonia at shooting guard? We know what Fizdale's likely to do as he develops the young guys and plays 15 minutes for Trier in the last game. But there's a lot of value opening up here. Dennis Smith at 6,600. I'm all about that for Big Den. A massive opportunity uh, for him in this game. Huge minutes last game. Moutier and Nilakina both remain out. Ishmith's at 37. I'm not interested. I am interested in Reggie Jackson if he wasn't 6,800. That's a big price tag. Now, Reggie's been putting up good numbers. 36 average over the last five, but I feel like if it wasn't the Knicks, I wouldn't want anything to do with it. And even though it is the Knicks, I think it's still a little bit risky. The shooting guards is what I really like here. Tria, Dotson, and Canard, all pretty cheap. 38 for Tria, 37 for Dotson, 48 for Canard. I don't know who the Knicks are going to start. I would imagine it would be Dotson, who has had a 40-point game this season. Trier's had a 48-point game, and Canard's had a 37-point game. So I'd put Trier as more of a GPP guy. I'd put Canard's value as probably the safest out of them, given the absences there and the the, the likelihood that he has uh, to, to start here over, over where Reggie Bullock was. Of course, the Shark Bruce Brown is still involved there in Detroit as well. But all three of those guys have a big, big amount of value. As for McKay Luke, as for Kyrie Thomas, Langston Galloway, uh, the Shark, I don't really see any of them being strong options here. At small forward, you've got the Fort, Kevin Knox at 5,000. He's going to get shots off, no doubt about it. The Pistons have def defended small forwards well this season, but without uh, Reggie Bullock and Stan Johnson, that might be a little bit different. So I think Kevin Knox is absolutely worth a tournament look here. While Hazonia at 4,500, I can't really trust the minutes uh, with him or the production. At power forward, Griffin's at 9,000. He should crush the Knicks here, while Vonley is at 4,800, and he has been quite poor of late. I would leave him alone. At center, Drummond at 10,000. What a massive opportunity this is for him up against uh, the Knicks, and he's done well against them, as have all centers. While Mitchy Robinson's at 46. He played 24 minutes last game. Mitch had 31 points. He is absolutely in play. Now, there is still a level of variability and uncertainty with how Fisdale's going to run things. What a redundant statement that is. But at 4,600, he is a GPP guy. DeAndre Jordan is a strong, strong fade, and Thon McCare. We don't know if it'll be him or Zaza Pachulia that's the backup center. I would imagine it's McCare, but even then, I don't really want anything to do with him. On DraftKings, 3,500 for Luke Kennard is one of the players of the day, I believe. Dennis Smith at 58, I love. Drummond at 86 is strong. Damo Dotson, 36, also comes in looking pretty good. And Griffo at 89. I also love Reggie Jackson on DraftKings. That $5,600 price tag is a really, really sexy number. Next up, let's look at the Denver Nuggets and the Philadelphia 76ers. No spread at this point for this game. We know that Gaz Harris is out. Nice, Gary! Paul Millsap is questionable. Uh, JJ Redick is not on the injury report. And the big news in Philadelphia, Haywood Highsmith is questionable with tonsillitis. Of course, Joel Embiid 
is also questionable with gastroenteritis. And if Embiid is out, what's going to happen at center? Are we going to have Jonah Bolden? Are we going to have Boban starting? That's a real possibility because they're going to be your two centers there. Or is Prison Mike going to shift over for a real small ball lineup? So there's massive value potentially opening up if Embiid is out with Bolden. No power forward. Uh, let me rephrase. Tobias Harris is your new power forward, um, but your backup power forward's in flux, and then you've got an opportunity there for Boban to step into that starting lineup. So some real value could appear for Philadelphia. As for the uh, point guards, we've got the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray, 6,700. He was strong in his first game back. No reason to think that he can't be a 30-plus guy here, although the matchup is a negative, so that might be a reason to think that he can't do it. Benny Simmons is at 93. I'd like to fade in the first game uh, playing alongside Toby Harris just to see how it all works. TJ McConnell is a similar story. Jim Butler's at 82. I think that's probably a little bit high for Jimmy. Again, just the uncertainty with how everything meshes. While well, Malik Beasley at 48. And you go, yeah, Gaz is out. Beasley's is going to start. He's scoring well. He just does nothing else. And that's what always limits him. So he's played 30 minutes a night over the last three and averaged 25 points. And that's okay. And I feel good about his floor. I just, is his upside actually high enough here despite Harris being out because he doesn't do anything else? That's the worry I have with Beasley for his overall tournament upside. Monty Morris had 35 in 28 minutes last game, even with Murray back. I think at 6,500, he is too expensive. While Farton, Will Barton at 52, he has been really bad, averaging only 20 points over the last five. I think that he is an interesting tournament guy because that salary has come down, but I wouldn't want to trust it in cash. And Redick, much like the other starters, a little bit too risky to use given the, uh, the addition of Harris. Paul Millsap's at 5,500. That's a no from me. Well, Toby Harris is down all the way to 7,000. Uh, that's come down from 7,800. Again, the fit is unsure at this point. I would only be looking at Toby as a tournament guy, but even then, there's a bit of risk there. Well, Bolden at minimum salary. Jonah Bolden, 3,500. Prison Mike at 37. They could come into play if Embiid is actually sidelined. Now, Jokic is at 11 2. I'm all about Nick at that sort of a salary and a good matchup. While Embiid at 11 9, I also like the matchup for him if he happens to uh, if he happens to play. And of course, if Boban is into the starting lineup, then he would be a really, really strong option. On DraftKings, I like Jokic and Embiid. Uh, Millsap at 48 maybe gets me interested. It probably doesn't. And I think that Jamal Murray at 6,300 also comes in looking pretty good over on the old DK. Next up, the Chicago Bulls and the Brooklyn Nets. The Nets are eight and a half point favorites, and the total is 223.5. Otto Porter uh, could be, or he's likely to debut for the Chicago Bulls. But conflicting reports, the Bulls were discussing a buyout with Robin Lopez, and then they weren't discussing a buyout with Robin Lopez. And if he goes, who is the starting center on this team? Would they start Larry Markin in there, put Porter at the four, and go back to Wayne Selden at the three? Would they start Cristiano Felicio and play him 48 minutes? They couldn't do it 48 minutes because he would die. But that would be, there'd be some interesting options opening up there for Selden and Felicio. And even now with Lopez, there is an opportunity for value there. Zach Levine is listed as, as probable with his ankle issue, which has bothered him for quite a while now. Chrissy Dunn, who the Bulls came out and said they are not convinced that he is the point guard of the future. And I don't agree with Gar Pax very often, but they are right. Chris Dunn is not good, and they are right to have been shopping him in the trade deadline and to not consider him a part of their four. Now, they said Zach Levine, Otto Porter, uh, Larry Market, and Wendell Carter. We've got four of our five core pieces of our starting lineup moving forward, so they're still evaluating Chris Dunn. But that doesn't mean shit here because I like the matchup. 7,100, I'm all about Chris Dunn. Shabazz Napier at 5,700. I think that's not a bad flaw, but we do have to remember that Karis Levert is back for the Brooklyn Nets today, so that could have an impact on Shabazz, but Spencer Dinwiddie remains out. At shooting guard, Russell's at 8,800. D'Angelo, I like that. It's a good matchup for D'Angelo, despite Karis returning, and Levine at 7,800. I think that's also pretty good, assuming he plays. Now, as for Karis, down at 4,500, I just think that the minutes are going to be really, really low here. They played Alan Crabb only 13 minutes last game. Is Crab going to be out of the rotation with Levert back, or will it be Rowdy Roddy on Skorooks? Someone's going to lose out here, and they're going to be out, no doubt. And Napier is going to be that guy eventually, uh, but someone is going to lose some significant minutes on this team with players getting healthy. Saldo, Wayne Seldon's at 3,600. He had a 36-point game the other day, so if they do decide to start Larry Markkinen, his value jumps up. While well, Trevion Graham played well last time out against Denver, I am a little bit skeptical about that repeating itself. Smoke and Joe Harris is at 54. The return of Levert uh, sours me marginally. While Otto Porter comes in at a very nice 6,900. Giggity! Um, 
can Porter be that guy to take on a little bit of extra usage? Well, he doesn't really need to do too much. Now, these aren't good players, but they're high usage players, Markin and Levine and Dunn. So that could help Porter settle in there. I'm not thinking that he's the greatest DFS guy. While Damari Carroll was excellent last game, 49 points in 28 minutes. But again, someone needs to lose some playing time for Levert to return. Hollis Jefferson's at 43. You can have that for yourself. Eddie Davis, no thank you. Lowry's at 8,100. He played 41 minutes last game and scored 43 points. This could really be a big opportunity for Markkinen, who's averaging 41 over the last five. Not a horrendous play. And big men against the Nets have been pretty strong all season. Well, Robin Lopez at 4,400. If he's not waived, I think he's a good bet to get cash, cash value. We know centers against the Nets go big, and this is an opportunity. Otherwise, we're looking at the other side of things. Felicio, minimum salary. He's not great. No doubt about that. He's not a good player, but he could very easily get you 22 or 23 points, and that's okay in the FanDuel scoring system. Jarrett Allen also gets a positive matchup against the Bulls. His production hasn't been great of late, but if you're going to take a flyer on Jarrett, you want to do it when they're taking on the Chicago Bulls. On DraftKings, Allen and Napier have some value. I like Porter a lot at 5,800. D'Angelo and Robin Lopez at 82 and 4,000, respectively. Zachy Levine at 69. Giggity! And Chrissy Dunn at 65 have value as well on DraftKings. Next up, we look at the Milwaukee Bucks and the Dallas Mavericks. Blowout risk is definitely here. The Bucks are eight-point favorites. The total is almost a Richie Benno, 222 and a half. The Dallas Mavericks have lost four of their starting lineup members now. So no Harrison Barnes, no DeAndre Jordan, no Dennis Smith, no Wes Matthews. We don't know what this lineup is going to look like at this point. I would guess Doncic, Brunson, Hardaway, Finney Smith, and Kleber, with Dwight Powell getting a boost in value as well. Injury-wise, uh, Chris Middleton is out for the Bucks. He is managing his load. Uh, Yanni Antetokounmpo, Sterling Brown, and Georgie Hill are all listed as probable, but there's a real probability that they smack the shit out of Dallas here, and again, we get everyone except for Yanni playing under 30 minutes, so that is a concern. At point guard, Brunson's at 4,900, the burner. He had 30 points last game at 4,900. I would take that. I think his role will be solid. While Eric Bledsoe at 7,800 wasn't traded. He is putting up just monster numbers. 40-point average over the last five in only 29 minutes. The matchup's strong. Is it too good, though? And he plays only 24 minutes. I think he's okay, but there's a, a, an element of risk there. George Hill is not okay. Doncic is listed as questionable. Now, Doncic has played through most games where he's been questionable. At 10,000, he is going to have an absolute usage monster load here. He should be looking at 50. I like him if he plays. Brogo's at 63. I think that's a little high. Timmy Hardaway at 6,000. He's only a tournament guy. Tone Snell should start for Middleton, and he will proceed to do nothing, as is uh, written in scripture. At small forward, Dorian Finney-Smith. He had 32 points last game in 33 minutes. Another opportunity with the pencil Harrison Barnes gone. Is this the guy that uh, Finney-Smith is? No. Is he okay as a tournament upside guy? Probably not, because I don't actually think his upside is all that high. So he's, he's, eh, he's in discussions, at least. Nick Miritich, we don't know if he is going to play. For the uh, Bucks, he's at 6,000. I'd probably end up fading that regardless. Well, Antetokounmpo Kumpo's at 12,000. And against an opponent who they weren't likely to smack, which is basically not the whole league at the moment. Not the whole league. My English doesn't work anymore. Uh, 12,000 for Antetokounmpo. Kumpo. A little bit risky. In saying that, his lowest score of his last five has been 51. So I'd be pretty bloody happy to get 51 as, as, a, as a low score. Uh, Justin Jackson came across from the Kings. Not sure if he'll play. Pretty confident he won't have an impact. For the big men, for the centers, Brookie Lopez, 5,400 for Brook. Uh, big opportunity to go big here, but if Miritich does play, it probably puts a little bit of a cramp on what Lopez is doing. Probably still just more tournaments here. And then we've got Dwight Powell and Maxi Kleber. 5,300 for Klebs uh, and 6,000 for Dwighty. I would take Kleber just for that lower salary, although Powell went off last game, steals and blocks and rebounds. He had 40 points at $6,000. That's a great return, but I feel like he's been priced up probably just a little bit too much here, old Dwight. Next up, on Dra or not next up, let's go to DraftKings. Powell, Finney Smith at 39, I really like. Powell at 44, I smash that. Hardaway at 49, I like Kleber, I like Doncic, I like Bledsoe. There's a ton of value in this game. One of the biggest value games on the slate on DraftKings. And that 4,300 for Brunson. And nearly all the value is coming from the Dallas side of things. They don't have the flexibility of sitting their stars because they don't really have them outside of Doncic. So there's some real value potentially opening up there in Dallas. The Golden State Warriors and the Phoenix Suns. 
Just stay away from this from the Golden State perspective. No spread, no total, huge blowout risk, limited minutes right across the board, and there's a chance that Devin Booker doesn't play, which could open up a ton of value actually for Phoenix. Tyler Johnson is going to start at point guard. Why wouldn't you get a 28-year-old non-point guard to be your starting point guard? It's always a great move as a rebuilding franchise. He's at 4,700. His highest score this season is 38. He's worth at least having a look at. The matchup's not great for him. Um, but he is worth having a look, especially if Booker does happen to sit. Steph's at 92. Oh, it's just so hard to use these guys, considering they might sit the entire th- uh, fourth quarter. Quinn Cook, Ali Okobo, Shawnee Livingston, very little to see with those guys. At shooting guard, Clay Thompson. Well, Clay, Durant, Draymond, Steph, the value is the same for all of them. It's a big, big risk and really only a tournament scenario. Igadala, Jamal Crawford, not interested in any of them. This is a terrible game for fantasy, assuming Booker plays. Uh, actually, that's not true. There's some value on the Phoenix side. Uh, McCall Bridges, 4,700 for Big Mick. Um, putting up strong numbers based on a lot of defense. I'm not really feeling super confident about him here, though. Well, Ubre is at 67. That's too high. Durant at 98, we've talked about already. Let's talk Joshy Jackson. Giggity. He would definitely be a pre... I don't know why I pushed the giggity, because I've been up for about 24 hours. Uh, he would appreciate being 6,900. Giggity. Um, he'd been really, really strong lately, uh, Jackson, averaging 43 over the last three. If Booker's out, I think he's pretty much a cash lock. Uh, and Rashawn Holmesy Holmes at 37, uh, not doing it for me. I do like Aiton, though. 7,300 for DeAndre. He had 41 last time against Golden State. The Warriors have allowed centers to put up big numbers for majority of this season, and DeAndre, uh, DeAndre Aiton is a center, so there's a, a big opportunity there for him to put up some numbers. Boog Cousins, I think minutes will be limited. He's putting up good numbers, but at 7,500, I want a little bit more reliability. Kavon Looney at 41, yeah, not really going to happen. It's, there's a lot of uncertainty in that matchup with the Booker uh, injury and with the Warriors likely to smack him. On the uh, on the DraftKings side, I like Aiton as well. Booker at 83 comes in pretty well, but I, I'd be really cautious about utilizing him. Uh, you can look at guys like Josh Jackson over there at 5,900 as well. Uh, with some real value if uh, if Booker is out. And Ubre at 59, I do like him on DraftKings significantly more than I like him on FanDuel. Next up, the Timberwolves and the Pelicans. No spread or total at this point. Anthony Davis is off the injury report. He is set to resume action and play here. Of course, Miritich is gone, so we're going to get a Davis-Randall starting front court most likely. Alfred Payton is out, and we don't know the status of each one more. Now, if Moore is out, we're going to get a lot more Kenrick Williams. I think Williams is still a chance to start regardless of the status of each one more. We've seen more benched at times already this season. And on the Minnesota side of things, it's a mess. Derek Rose, Jeff Teague, they're both questionable. And then today, uh, their replacement, Jared Bayless, he is also questionable. He sprained his ankle. Uh, sorry, he hurt his toe. And then Jared Terrell, the fifth string point guard, sprained his ankle in the G League. So a bunch of stuff, which is obviously pretty frustrating for the Timberwolves that their whole team has basically got foot injuries at this point. So there's a lot of value that could potentially open up at that point guard spot. We might see CJ Williams playing a lot of minutes at point guard there. They really don't, or oh, Jesus, I was, was going to say Isaiah Cannon's a good value play, but he's not a good player. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty on this back-to-back with the Minnesota Timberwolves. At point guard, we've got Derek Rose at 54. I don't feel confident in him playing. I wouldn't want to use Teague after missing so much time. Uh, Jared Bayless comes in at 5,300. I think he is a GPP upside sort of a guy here, uh, old Jared. But there's again, there's just so much... Um, so much uncertainty with how this whole uh, how this whole lineup is is going to roll because of all the uh, all the multiple injury scenarios that that are happening on this team with the with the point guards at shooting guard Drew Holiday's at ninety four hundred rock solid floor guy strong cash guy while Wiggins actually dropped fifty one today he's at six thousand I like the upside ability here of Wiggins I think he's a tournament guy at Kogi was okay, but not really doing it for me. Well, Frank Jackson should get another start and should be avoided in DFS. At small fort, Etwan Moore, no. Darius Miller, no. Stan Johnson, no. Even if he does play, that's a no. Well, Kenrick Williams is a power fort. I like him a lot here, 5,500. Strong, strong price for Kenrick. 
and Taj Gibson and Dario Saric uh, probably fades to me on Minnesota. Randall's at 8,300. The return of Davis puts a little bit of a cramp. That price is just too high, I believe, so I won't want to use that. While Tone Davis at 13,000, there's no way I want to use Davis at that salary. Townsie's at 11,200, averaging 66 his last three times against the Pelicans. I'm happily using Carl Anthony Towns here. I think Davis will be a little bit rusty, and of course, we're not going to be using Jolly Locafor at 7,400, too expensive for what should amount to a backup center. On DraftKings, Towns is at 10,000, like that there. Kendrick Williams at 5,000, I like it. Wiggins at 6,000, and probably less appeal for him on DraftKings, while Tone Davis at 11 2. That gets me marginally interested, but even still, I think we only have to look at Davis as a GPP guy at this point. The last game, the Miami Heat and the Sacramento Kings. The Kings are favored by 2.5, and, and the total is 218.5. We might get a more streamlined Miami Heat rotation with Tyler Johnson and Wayne Ellington both out. Miami looks like they're going to be starting Scooter Magruder at shooting guard because why wouldn't you reinsert a guy who shouldn't be into the rotation into the rotation? And the power forward scenario remains a confusion. Kelly Linick will likely start, but last game it was Jim Johnson who was in there making us proud. For Sacramento, Alec Burks and Harrison Barnes should be available to make their, their debuts for their new team. At point guard, De'Aaron Foxy Fox, 7,500. Negative matchup for Foxy. Um, I'd probably end up fading him. He has done well at times against Miami in the past. I'm not super into him here at that sort of salary with a bit of a downturn in form from him of late. Well, Dion Wade is at 43. I think that's a strong tournament play, a positive matchup for Dion with an opportunity with Johnson gone to see a boost in his playing time. Dwayne Wade at 6'3". Love what Wade is doing. I'm just not sure that that salary provides the right sort of value. Yeah, there's something there for Wado. Well, Bogdanovich at 5,700, strong last game, but now you've got to integrate Harrison Barnes into the mix, and I think that's going to put a real cramp on Bogdanovich's value. Budrick Hield at 65, I think he's a fade as well. Small forward Winslow, 5,800, despite being the starting point guard. He's listed as a small forward. Uh, I like the matchup for Winslow here. I'd only be using him in tournaments. Josh Richardson at 66, I think he's a strong tournament play as well. The pencil at 55, Harrison Barnes, I'd probably leave him alone. At a bio, Bagley at 67. I worry about Bagley's playing time if they go with a lot more Barnes at power forward here. That could be a concern. While James Johnson and Alinek, you wouldn't want to roster them together, but you could throw either of them into a tournament with clear 35-point upside. And then at center, I love Hassan Whiteside here. Although 8,000 is high, I think he beats it, but I wouldn't want to trust my cash lineup to have him in. But in a tournament, I really like Whiteside. Corley Stein is the opposite of like, and that would be dislike. So that's uh, where I am with a big old Will Corley, uh, Will Corley Stein. Uh, over on DraftKings, I like Waiters, I like Wado, I like uh, Whiteside. Joshy Richardson at 61, also Hassan. Hassan. I've lost it. Justice Winslow at 5,500 also comes in looking pretty good and a fade on Bogdanovich as well over on uh, over on DraftKings. Let's go through some value plays of the day now, which could change, of course. Uh, DraftKings, we've got D'Angelo Russell as my started. My uh, value guy is the Duck, Luke Kennard. On FanDuel, it's D'Angelo, and my value guy is Damo Dotson. On Yahoo, my stud is Townsy, and my... Uh, and my value play is the duck. And on draft stars, my value or my start is, is Jokic. And my value play is the duck, Luke Kennard. It's been a very, very long day, a long day of podcasting, tons of content from here and right across the Locked On Podcast Network as well. Make sure you're subscribing to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and of course, on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, uh, click the uh, thumbs up and leave a comment below the video. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Robin Lopez.